And I will also turn on live transcript. All right, everyone, thank you for coming to this uh, Augur hackathon, getting to know about Augur. We, we have an agenda that we're going to follow, which is right here. We're going to talk about everything about Augur and how to contribute, look at the file structure, what they contain. We'll go through installation and the process of adding a new worker. So with that in mind, um, I am just going to do real quick before we get started. The one thing I am less familiar with than uh, my team right now is how to add a new worker because we just changed um, that process. I'm sending a Discord message to my team to see if anyone's able to join us. have to put the uh, participants invite copy invite link all right so since that's last hopefully one of my team members will be able to join I know less about that than the other things in auger but um, I'm hopeful someone can uh, can join us so Let's just start with everything about Augur. So those of you who've heard of Augur know that it is a data collection system for adding information, you know, basically collecting effectively all of the information about um, any open source software project. And this is the directory structure. How it works can be described in a couple of different ways. The first that I'm going to show you is just through the front end. Um, there are a couple of things and I remember I'm just trying to there was a there was a version with everything that I used yesterday. What was it? Oh gosh. Brain, brain, brain. All right, well, I'll, I'll, it'll come to me momentarily. So, Augur, um, effectively, if you look at the group, so under groups, you'll see a list like this in the front end. Under repos, you'll see a list like this, which is each of the repositories in various groups and I can order them by group name and under insights which there aren't any I don't I don't believe at this um, particular auger location and I'm trying to remember one that oh I know I know what it is so I'll use the eBay instance under insights um, Augur has some workers that look for anomalies. So the way that works is it trains the data based on the last thousand days of commit issue and pull request activity and looks for changes from the moving average using a, a random forest algorithm to essentially identify whether or not in the last 14 days any particular um, repository has seen a statistically significant increase or decrease in activity. And I'll explain the machine learning workers when we go through the parts of Augur. The purpose of Augur is to give someone who's looking at a collection of open source projects some kind of idea of you know, how much activity and what kinds of activity exist in 
in that repository. So similar to Grimoire Lab and other tools, we're, we're trying to present a sense of the overall health using Augur, Augur metrics. And when you're looking at uh, a list of the repos, uh, it's somewhat intuitive that, for example, um, some, some repos will have more activity than others. Is this in the direction of what we're looking for under everything about Augur and how to contribute? Looking for a yes, Sean, you're on the right track for an intro <laughs> or not. So at a high level, this is what Augur is trying to accomplish. If I go to, for example, this eBay project, you can see that Augur indicates license coverage. It lists the lines of code added by the top 10 Augur uh, contributors over time. If I widen this a little bit, you can see the lines of code added by the top 10 authors. And if I click a year, you can see by month um, how much. And then go back there. And it's like that. Now, this shows average lines of code for per commit. It shows organization information, which has to be provided by whomever the Augur user using organization is. And then it looks at um, gives you reviews and pull requests by the week, um, number accepted by week, uh, pull requests declined, issues opened closed issues, new issues, code changes, which are, uh, these are lines or, or commits. Um, these are lines of code added per week. And then if there were library files used, it, they would be listed there. Over here, there's another tab called risk metrics, which shows the number of forks by week, the number of committers by week, whether or not there's a CNCF best practices badge, uh, the types of licenses that are declared, and uh, where there's uh, no assertion of the license, but a license of some kind is declared, and then the coverage. Uh, it also indicates the percent of OSI approved licenses of those that exist. So this, this is Augur's original overview of information uh, provided by week. Okay, Sean, I had a question, a follow-up question. Yeah. So, um, like, would it be possible for you to, like, show us, like, how Olga works with an example? Does it, like, work instantly? Like, when you plug in a repository, does it take, like, does it work instantly where it gathers all these insights? Like, say, for example, you take in um, maybe... Um, a random repository and puts puts the um GitHub repo details and all that stuff. Does it work like instantly? Then, if yes, could you like show us like an example? Sure. So it doesn't do it instantly. So the way that and and I most tools, in fact, all tools that are in the Chaos Project, don't provide data instantly. There is a data collection. Uh, period so it takes a certain amount of time right now the current version of auger which is under the auger dash new branch and um i'll just make some notes here over the over the agenda oops i can type um Current branch is branch we are working on is Augur new. And that that I expect to release any day now. I've been working through some final glitches in, in Augur new. Um, really very minor um, glitches. So in the past, it might take Augur over a month to collect data for 10,000 repos. Now we can collect all of the data for 10,000 repos in less than a week. And that's because of some new technologies that we've, we've um, 
come come to employ. So when it comes to adding new information to Augur, there are there are two approaches. One, which I think is the place to start, is immediately following the installation of Augur and, and is at the command line. And I'll show you that. Uh, briefly now, I'll just show you a new Augur interface. Oops, if I could type TV without an Sorry. Augur has a, a new interface <clears throat> right now. And this, this new interface does a couple of things that I'll explain briefly. One of the things it does is if I create a user, I can go to that user's profile and add a new repo or, or organization that I want to collect data for. Does, does anyone have a so many of the ones that would be obvious, like chaos, are already collected. Uh, does anyone have a GitHub organization that they'd like to have new data collected for? Any organization would do. So you do not need to have like a right access to submit one? Correct. Okay, let me find one. Let me, let me use the to-do group, maybe. Yeah, that'd be great. So just all, like I, all I need is the GitHub organization name, or I can I can do the full URL. Let me get that too. Okay, I I think um I will drop Drupal in the chat. Okay, drop it in the chat. Hang on, chat. Drupal. Okay. So what happens here is I'll add Drupal and that will take a minute. We're working on, you can see by the X not being finished here that it's still working. One of the changes that John, um, one of our maintainers is, is creating in this interface is it will show you a waiting sign. And so now it's, uh, it's a say, it'll say successfully added repo or org and um, it's not apparently clear. We're also going to make this a little bit more clear what your user repos are. Um, now, if I go back to Augur, oops, well, that didn't work. Um, it will, let's see if it added. So it doesn't, it doesn't show you that immediately, <laughs> um, but it did add the Drupal organization and I can demonstrate that um, real quickly here. Give me one second. I can demonstrate it that it, I can demonstrate that it actually added uh, the repo. by showing you the database. Um, maybe that's not the one. All right, hang on just a second. Rhea.chaos TV, is that unstable? Well, I think, oh, I know, I know what I did. There's a little bit of a, it should create ordinarily under normal circumstances. All right, well, this would reveal that I don't recall specifically which database this is getting added to, but you'll have to trust me while I remember that um, uh, later, uh, that it, it does add the, um, uh, one, hold on one 
one second. I'm just going to pause the recording because nobody wants to watch this. Resume recording. So when you when you do that step where you add a repo group, you end up sharing. Uh, it ends up creating an entry for all of those repos. And I'm just sharing a portion of my screen right now. So this is the repo database and you can see I don't know can you see this okay because unfortunately I can't make it bigger yeah I can so yeah. you can see that it added all of the repositories under repo under Drupal and so one of the indications that it's not collected yet is when you add when you add the repos it'll queue them for collection and repos that have just been added in the repo database will list the git url but it won't the repo status will be new and it won't have just yet processed it so that the repo name or the repo path which is internal to augur the repo path is where the cloned repository is stored and the repo name is of course the name of the repo and new would change to complete once the calculation of all of the information about the repo was was satisfied does that make sense so if i go back here under under this eventually yeah there's an error there because i have a bunch of empty repo names which is a again something we're working on correcting but now you now you can at the zoo.chaos TV site. Um, and I don't know how to make this portion of the screen bigger, but oops. They, they will eventually show up over here. Make sense? Yeah. yeah. Okay, so go question ahead. In chat. So the next, maybe to explain kind of how Augur works, um, one of the next things I'll do, so that's that's basically showing you that when a repo is added, the repo is created in the repo database and is queued for collection at that point, which is use, useful to, to say the least. Um, and here are some repos that have had the data collected for them already. Um, but your question was just kind of how do all the pieces work together, right? Like what's the, what's the technical flow of Augur? Am, am I getting that correctly? Yeah. Okay. So I'm trying to decide if it's better to, let me maybe explain how about I explain like in a, on a whiteboard, the overall architecture of how these things all work together and then go back into describing the file structure and more in, a, in greater detail, how they all work together. Does that seem like a good approach? Yeah, that would make it make it. Okay. All right. So while I get my whiteboard set up, I'm just going to, yeah, how many times I'm doing this for a class and I forget um, things like the recording. So we have Git repositories. Can you read the word Git all right? Or is that shining? Is there a light shining on that? It's a little bit. Uh, does that make it better or worse? Yeah, it's better. Okay. I don't know where the glare is coming from. Oh, maybe here. All right, that's a little bit better, but can you see the word get? Barely? Yes, you can. Okay, I'm going to use some darker colors green here. Okay, so your get your get repository almost always exists on some platform. And this can be usually it's GitHub or GitLab. 
And in addition to the Git repository, which which they store, there's also these Git terms here. Pull requests. Issues. Contributors and messages. Now, all of these, all of these things, which, and you can read this okay. I'm sorry, I just want to keep making sure that you can read it all right. Yeah. Yeah, I think it's clear. Okay. So, all this data exists on a platform somewhere. And Augur has, obviously, we list the repos that get attached. And then we have collection. So data collection, forget we do a clone and we count commits, lines of code, author, author is the person who wrote the code who who made the commit the author is the basically the person who commits the change and then we have a term called contributor for which there's also data in the table and this is the person who merges the change these can be the same people and this is the, the author is the person who creates the change triangles a chemistry function for change if you're not familiar with that. For pull requests issues. Contributors. And messages. This is all done, this is all collected using a. A platform. API. And so we have we have something called so to access the platform API. Augur now has something called tasks. And I'll show that to you. Tasks are the artist formerly known as workers. So a common Augur language previously had been workers. Now we call them tasks. Each of the tasks performs functions that collect all of the data related to these primary entities um, on GitHub. It's also worth noting that there are other things that we collect that could be relevant for a particular case. These include events, um, releases, and metadata. Metadata includes things like the plat, essentially the platform's view. the platform count for issues, commits, PRs, etc. So that becomes relevant a little bit later. Um, but these are some of the other things that the, the tasks also collect. So for a task that collects, uh, let me use one example, pull requests information pull requests include of course the pr itself it also includes um the um the uh what do you call it the 
head and the base so we know what fork was used to create that pull request and to where it was merged. It also, uh, these, this pull request base also includes a status and that can, the status can be merged, closed, or open. Merged means the same as closed. Merged and closed both mean closed. If the status is closed, it means it was closed without being merged. And if it was merged, of course, it means it was merged. And then, of course, when it's merged, it's closed. Um, it can also, it also includes things like assignees, labels, and some other, other metadata reflected in the tables that may, may not be uh, occurring to me right now. And then for each of these pull requests and all of the things about it, there are there are pull request files and commits. So in the case of pull requests, all of the things are are um in there so it's, a pull request isn't one just one table but it's all the things about a pull request the same holds for issues same same exact metaphor um an important piece of all of this is the assignees um are there, it also includes the most, uh, yeah. We also include who created the pull request and who closed or merged it. These are people. So, and obviously all the merge dates and things like that. So the things I'm, can you see that I'm, I've circled assignees, people created and closed and merged in purple? Can you distinguish that color purple? Uh, I can't really. Yes, no, not really. Not really. I can't really. Okay, let me, um, let me try a different color. What about the orange? Is that easier to distinguish? That's much better in my opinion. Okay, okay, good. So these are all contributors contributors are obviously important to us so i think i heard isaac's voice isaac joined us isaac's going to explain the task stuff how much time do you have isaac uh i have a big chunk oh, okay all right so great um but i will still try to get to that part of the question while you're here early so you don't have to spend two hours with us. Um, so contributors are really critical because the author for a pull request and the contributor for a pull request, the person who merges it, all of these things are people. And one thing to know, and you may, you may already have figured this out in a sense, about any kind of uh, auger or anything else is that knowing who did something is kind of important and useful. And we have, and Isaac specifically, has created some logic because if you recall, we're doing a clone count for the commits. One of the distinct and interesting things about commits is the, the platform identifier for the person is not included in the Git log. And so, these by default are emails and everything else is a github and i'm just using github as an example um, it's both an id which is numeric and a username 
as an aside, username, people can now change their username on GitHub. So the canonical platform identifier is now ID. Um, Isaac can discuss a little bit more about how that gets resolved. So when Augur run, go ahead, um, question. Oh yeah, for uh, the contributors in terms of like how we're identifying them, like we have a UUID that basically takes into account like the user ID and the platform ID together. And that's just like one value that's universal for all contributors across all platforms. That's actually important. Thanks, Isaac. This is a change in the latest version of Augur. The fact that the contributor ID is a UUID that combines the, what are they combining in Alex? I mean, Isaac? Uh, it's the, like the canonical, it, it depends on the platform because platforms have different things, but for GitHub, it's the platform and the, um, and the user ID. I mean, obviously the platform ID for all platforms will have to be there because it distinguishes the platform, but the individual user ID will be a bit different because, you know, and we're using the ID because people can now change their username. So if we use the username, it's, in, it's possible a username will go away. The ID won't go away. If you change your username to Tony from Fred, then we would lose all of, all of Fred's references. But Tony and Fred will always have the same ID. So it's the platform, in this case GitHub, plus that ID that GitHub assigns to every user. And then Isaac processes with uh, the commit counting tool, which is called Facad, derived from work that Brian Warner did um, 10 years ago and significantly evolved with Brian's blessing and permission um, in Augur, uh, will resolve all that information to the same contributor. <clears throat> so a contributor, if, if my contributor is Let's, let's go with me. If I am dead marker, if I am s at goggins.com in my commit record, because commits are all by email, then Isaac goes through and identifies that s at goggins.com maps to S. Goggins on GitHub. And this whole thing is stored as a UUID. Why this is important is because if you collect UUIDs for a collection of a thousand repos, those UUIDs will be exactly the same on any other Augur instance where I contribute with the email s at goggins.com or any of my other emails. So I have, for example, in my case, I've probably contributed to GitHub on 12 or using 12 or more emails. And my UUID will be exactly the same on all instances of Augur, which ultimately would make it easier to integrate all of the data from all of the instances of all instances that you might have of Augur uh, if, if you chose to do that. So the platform API stores, stores just, um, if I'm looking for the platform API and the, the contributor, that's automatically stored using this same UUID, but I have, I have it, I have this GitHub username and password already collected because that's what the API gives me. And if I've also made commits, it's going to map to the same, to the same UUID. Does so that, so that's, and then the same would hold for issues. Uh, contributors are gathered following this, this example. So anytime, anytime, for example, a pull request encounters a user that isn't already in the contributors table, and contributors are stored in a contributors table, it will go and actually retrieve the information for that user that isn't already in the database. Is this all making sense so far or are people asleep? Making sense so far, Alex. <laughs> okay, probably the, the, the conceptually at least, the most important other thing to share um, 
uh, that that's important to understand is that messages we see messages in many places but the two main places are on issues and pull requests and so the way that we've organized messages is that there's um, and you can see the bottom i hope is i have an issue message is like a comment that you would make so if i have an issue one issue and i have a pr one pr i have one messages table where all of the messages for any platform and or all platforms and any issue in PR are all stored in the same table. There's a bridge entity relationally that's basically issue message, and we call it issue message ref, and PR message, which is PR message ref. That's important because if you only want to see, for example, the issues or the messages for pull requests. Um, pull requests has a one to many relationship with pull request messages. And pull request messages, you know, Isaac, is, is, this is, what's the, what's the relational thing here? Is this one to one? Uh, I can't make out what does it say between PR it's, and messages? It's, it, this is pull request, pull request, message ref, and messages. Um, here, let, let me see. Actually, I don't know off the top of my head because I'm thinking like a message would only apply to one PR pull message. Request message ref. Yeah, like there'd only be one reference there. Forgive me, I designed this relational model five years ago, or six years, four years ago. And, Andrew's um, been doing most of the method stuff, so I'm not super familiar with it. So um, I'm pretty sure this is one-to-one, -one, where each individual pull request message has a single message in the messages table. And the reason that um, we have this bridge entity in relational terms is so that we can distinguish the origin of, of the messages. Now, in hindsight, we could have done this differently, but as I said, I designed this four years ago and um, probably made it overly relational. Two important things. One is you can distinguish pull request messages from issue messages or other messages that we gather, and there's only one uh, each, all of the messages are stored in one table called messages. So, cons and, and so a task is basically anything that gathers data for, for Augur. That's what, that's what tasks are. Yeah. It's basically just like, uh, like it, it, it a, a concurrent thread that Augur can run. Or not really a thread, but you can think of it as one. But it's what we use for data collection. Any, any, like I've thrown a lot of junk on this whiteboard. Any, any conceptual questions here? Yeah, I wanted to ask one thing. Yeah. Uh, yeah, so I wanted to ask that, uh, is there some kind of an ordering that goes on with tasks? Is there some kind of moder? Oh, ordering. Yeah. Um, ordering. Yeah. There's a, a like tasks are organized into phases, basically. So um, there are like large groups of tasks that um, are differentiated because, like, for one reason or the other, they absolutely cannot or they're not supposed to run at the same time as other groups of tasks. Right. Um, so, like, an example would be like um, we have a preliminary phase where uh, currently the only thing that we do is we check all of our sources uh, in, in like say we have a, like 10 GitHub repos, we check to make sure those haven't moved URL or anything. 
before we run the rest of the uh, data collection. Um, another example would be the machine learning workers, like uh, they're pretty resource intensive, so we don't want them running at the same time as anything else, so they're in their own phase. Um, and within the phase, uh, you have various uh, ways of um, organizing individual tasks uh, that are given to you by Celery. Like uh, you can put all a bunch of tasks in a group and they'll run all at the same time, put a bunch of tasks in a chain and they'll run sequentially. And uh, there's uh, uh, more stuff you can do, obviously, but those are the basics. So for the, so the, the pro, after prelim, preliminary, Alex, it's the, do all the GitHub tasks kind of run in parallel or do they run sequentially in some way? Like the pull um, request issues. Are you asking if the like the repo collect phase do things run all like uh, concurrently? Yeah, yeah, they do. Um, yeah, like uh, if if things aren't like dependent on each other and they're in the same phase, there's no reason why they wouldn't be run at the same time. Like uh, like obviously like stuff like uh, there's a a task for uh, pull request files like that can't run until pull request is run because it, it's dependent on the pull request existing. Um, so th that is like a direct relationship that's specified within the phase, but like um, something like, uh, I don't know, like facade can run like at the same time as we collect pull requests because like there's no reason why they can't. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Maybe if like two workers are updating the same table, then they might not run at the same time is what the idea. And definitely machine learning workers need the data. So maybe they run after the entire collection is done. Yeah, we, we have That's actually run into to, to deadlock errors in regards to editing the same table at the same time. But um, yeah. we've because got, they're, they're very rare at, at this point. And um, I'm optimistic that they won't, like, I don't think that we'll need to, be that restrictive in uh, our table usage. So opinion. when I one one of the things I mentioned earlier is that where it used to take over a month to collect data for ten thousand repos, now it takes a week or so. One of the reasons is the Augur new branch, which will soon be the main branch, um, does a massive amount of parallelism compared to the prior version of Augur. Okay. okay. Uh, just just one last question over here like uh, this parallelism that we're talking about is it done by the use of multiple servers or are we using multi-threading in some you know on the same server to achieve that parallelism um it can be used with either right now we're uh, i'm just I, i've just been testing it all on the same uh, server and machine um it's possible for both though uh Celery supports both uh because uh, whenever you schedule a task or a phase or a group of tasks um, it just sends like it just queues that all up on um, on something like Redis or their other uh, uh, backend queuing uh, services. But like we use Redis, and so if you were to have your Celery instance running on a different server, you could totally do that. Mm -hmm. Okay. Oh, okay. Um, there was something else I was thinking that might warrant explanation right now um just one second um sean yeah um, manuela has a question oh okay so i'm sorry i can't see the tasks uh i can't see the, the ta let me see here uh emanuela do you want to go ahead sorry i'm having a little battery and i just want to ask that. okay yeah go ahead uh, Type it in chat if you're having microphones. Uh, do you want to use the chats? Since I think your audio is not coming up. Okay, we'll just wait for the question then. One 
I'm waiting or waiting for the question. Just, uh, Ruth, if you don't mind reading the question out loud when it comes. Okay. Um, question is, I'm interested in, very interested in auger, and so how can I contribute? I think that's the second part of um, Yes. Um, is, is Amela able to get a charger and join us for that second part? No, nah, she, she's almost dropping off. So maybe once. Okay. All right. Let me try to, let me try to hit that as quickly as I can. If not, it will be recorded. So the, the first thing that you probably want to think about when it comes to contributing is going to the to the downloads um, so if I were to look at the um, auger um, thing here there's there's two places um, to contribute one is the piece where we actually go through and and uh, install it Obviously, that's kind of a prerequisite, but the first place that I would point someone who maybe wants to make a contribution is in the Augur directory. So under the root of wherever you clone Augur in the Augur new branch. Oops, and I need to share my screen. So if I'm if I'm here under the auger auger directory, there is a folder called API. And under API there are APIs are effectively queries that present a RESTful API that provide an existing chaos metric or a metric model. And there are two kinds. One is a standard uh, metric and the other is a non-standard. And they have various characteristics. The end result uh, of which is uh, so it, the the things under oops, things under API. If they're a standard metric, for example, one of the standard metrics is. And these all return JSON objects that provide specific information. In the case of the repos, it's the ID, a name. Uh, sometimes if it's .github or .github, sometimes they don't exist. We're actually not going to include those in the next release. Uh, it includes the total number of issues, uh, the internal repo group ID, um, the URL, and the status. So that's what the repos. API gives you. Now, the API structure for a standard metric would be after repos, you could type in the ID of a repo and a metric. So one metric is committers. Um, I thought it was committers. Um, no, no, of course I So Augur, read the docs .io. Uh, I don't know why it's just not working.
So code changes is, um, if I go under metrics, I don't know how to navigate the file, but there somewhere is defined uh, a metric called code changes uh, in the API endpoints. And the standard metric like that will give you the name of the repo for the week and the year and the, the commit demo. Um, this may actually be a non standard metric, uh, but it'll. You know, Your audio kind of dropped. Do you want to change it? Say it again. Your audio dropped. Oh, um, is this better? Yeah, better. Yeah, sorry, I had to move my uh, microphone over to do the whiteboard and I forgot to move it back. Um, so one good place to start contributing is to look at the existing APIs and you can navigate them in the OSS docs. Um, area so that's that's one api doc endpoint and so that's um that's how the that's so if i was to go in here and under API metrics, again, our standard metrics routes are non-standard metrics. If I go into one of the standard metrics, this is actually a very easy pattern to follow. So if the metric that you want to develop is inside, uh, is a chaos metric, uh, you can take a look at any of the files under this metrics directory and they share a common structure. At the very top are these 12 lines of code with the SPDX identifier, a description of what's in this file, uh, these libraries, and it instantiates a database connection. Each individual metric can be identified or can be developed just using SQL. So if there's data in a chaos metric or metric model that you want to build the SQL for, First of all, some of the SQL may at first appear somewhat complex, but keep in mind that there are hundreds of different queries already developed, and you can use those as a pattern to follow for developing metrics. You could also, uh, in the Slack channel, ask a question like, I want to develop a metric endpoint for X, and we can help you get started with the SQL. All of these metrics, in addition to this register metric declaration, have a definition. So you'll define the method that metrics exists under and whether it's a repo and this signature, repo group ID, repo ID, begin and end date and period. If there is no repo group ID provided, you need to provide a repo ID. That's the most common use. The parameters are defined here. So in a standard metric, these are always the same. If the application or end user does not provide a begin and end date, simply the beginning of time according to computers is provided, uh, January 1st, 1970, and the end date is essentially the very second that you are making the request. The SQL variable is set to none just in case it's previously been set. And then it checks to see if a repo ID has been passed. If it has, it uses this SQL alchemy function, SQL alchemy .sql text. You can see up above that we've aliased SQL alchemy to S so that all we have to do down here is s.sql.txt, return, triple quote, put in your SQL, close triple quote, uh, one extent there. And it goes there. If a repo ID group is provided, it's a separate query. And then results in a standard metric are always returned as pandas reading the SQL. Um, 
connecting to the database with these parameters to get the results. And then, oops, the method, <coughs> excuse me, returns the results. Those results gets process, get processed by Augur into this JSON file as an API endpoint. So that is one easy way without getting real deep into Augur that you can get started um, helping with Augur. It applies some very uh, easily templated things, uh, and then you can build the metric. Um, the one thing that then we do ask is that once you've created your metric and you can decide if the metric that you want to create is something logically inside each of these existing uh, Python files or if it warrants its own Python file. Any, any questions before I press on? No, so um, I think maybe I'll let Manuela ask her question because that's our question. <coughs> I should open my chat just in case it comes that way. So Manuela, um, while you're preparing your question, if, yeah, if, if there's a, like, if you want to do, like the other thing that we'll probably talk about are tasks for data collection, uh, as well as installation and deployment. But if you um, want to get started you know, we can spend an entire session like this going through getting you started. Oh, I guess Manuela dropped off, but um, the- Yes, it looks like she did. <coughs> Hi. So I wanted to ask about some um, these print events that's, you know, maybe you want to, Nice. In order to be able to have a better clarity on how um, Algo works and how to contribute to it. So, uh, are you asking about? I heard the word events. So, are you asking about the file structure, or are you asking specifically about event objects that we might gather? Okay. Um, Sean. So, Ahmad is the person I talked about from Pi Data Ghana that wanted to do a sprint um with Augur. Yeah. I did, yeah, I did a Slack chat. Um, but yeah, I'm not sure you've seen it yet. Uh, Wait. I probably haven't. I was at the LF Member Summit last week, and I'm pretty behind on comms. Yeah. So, yeah. Ahmad, are you asking about um, what kind of what ways can they contribute, or like what was your question? Yeah, yeah, so it's kind of everything together, like what ways we can contribute. And um, I'm sure most people would want to contribute through code or some people want to contribute through code. And wanted to, I just wanted to like have a better idea of, um, I, I joined earlier, but I, I got distracted with work. And so I, I didn't get some of the details. But so I just wanted to see if um, looking at the file structure, we could, you know, get kind of what each of those um, files are doing and also how sure. what do it can contribute. Okay, okay. Um, so what? Sean, I want to add some more context. So yeah. uh, PyData Ghana um, is like a community and um, uh, Ahmad um, wants to run like a sprint with Augur. So he wants to kind of like understand how PyData uh, uh, community members can what's what and what's available that they can contribute since they do a lot of like I know they have like a lot of Python people interested in Python so I, I think from the file structure as well we we can get to how um, different members from PyData can contribute via the sprint okay um, my thinking is that one of Isaac I'm going to turn to Isaac here before I start jumping off because Isaac is deeper into things um, than I am. I, Isaac, what I'm thinking of for a group like PyData who has a lot of Python skills is that we might um, arrange or coordinate ta uh, sprints around uh, some of the tasks that we have yet to move over from um, the previous version of Augur, like the value and dependency workers expect. Ex especially, 
but oh, yeah. I don't know if that's not is that all right? Is that yeah? That seem... uh, it would be great to have like just experience like having new people like look over like the tasks and this in the the phase system that um, I designed to basically just making sure that uh, they can make sense of it and write good documentation for it. And basically, like, we should have a worker template like we have in the old version for the tasks that we have now. Um, but yeah, that, that, I, I think okay. that's a great idea. So what I'd, what I'd like to suggest that we, we do next is I'll provide a brief overview of the, the file structure in mm -hmm. Augur New. And then uh, I'll start talking about tasks and um, kind of set up a question for Isaac to help us walk through that part. Does that okay. seem reasonable? I'm on this outlook. Yeah, I think that I think that's going to be a good start. Thank okay. You. Okay, so I'm going to go back to the prime, the main Augur directory under the Augur new branch. Can't emphasize enough that this is where to work. Dot GitHub is um, essentially any GitHub tasks, act, GitHub action type things that we've organized. You don't need to look at that. The Augur directory includes API um, and what also I would consider the, the application, which is kind of the core um, Augur face, which you can ignore. Um, the tasks, which I just mentioned, and then utility functions, which are as I can assume the utility functions are simply things that are shared across different parts of Augur. <clears throat> Isaac may have stepped away. Oh, sorry, what? Um, that the, the util directory is just a bunch of utilities that may be shared across different parts of Augur? Yes, exactly. Okay. The other directories are Docker, somewhat uh, self-explanatory that this is where our docker stuff exists uh, front end is the directory for our what i what i'm calling our old front end which is basically this um, that's all uh, vue.js not to worry about for the most part scripts are primarily uh, things that we use to install and configure auger um, we have control scripts docker scripts and install scripts so those are mostly shell scripts that are used to get Augur set up. And tests are unit tests that primarily Andrew has written that effectively test the different parts of Augur um, and eventually will reintegrate that into a GitHub workflow of some kind. It used to be Travis CI, but Travis CI kind of blew up its whole model for everyone. Um, and so now we're putting the tests there. So the meat of where contributions would be most most welcome and helpful, obviously in any place where you find a, something you want to tidy up or whatever, always welcome. But under the Augur directory, it's this tasks directory, which is where the data collection work takes place. And this data collection work is divided into uh, four main categories. Data analysis is where the machine learning workers live. Git is where the facade or commit worker stuff lives. GitHub is where a great deal of stuff exists like contributors, detect move events, facades. Pretty much anything that interfaces with the GitHub API. Yeah um exists there so this is a, a place where um things uh, you know contributions would be useful uh, very useful extremely useful um to give you an idea the tasks directory originates from a different directory in our current main branch and it's essentially the way that we have uh, been able to parallelize thing par parallelize a lot of the work to enable much faster collection. Um, the workers that have not yet been moved over to tasks include the depths Libier worker, the depths worker, and there are others, but I'm going by highlights here, and the value worker. So in terms of workers that have 
the highest um, ROI for us, it would be depths worker, depths Libier worker, and value worker. Um, value worker. I'm just making a note of that. So Isaac, maybe now, should I hand control over to you so that you can demonstrate kind of the process that you went through or uh, just in terms of like how tasks like, are made? Like if, yeah, like if I let you drive, you can probably do so much faster than I could. Uh, I, I was uh, going to pull up uh, just like uh, one of the simple, like a simple task and just like show how it's organized. And yeah. So let it, giving you the letting you share is I think I think we agree on that letting you share. Yeah, yeah, yeah. one sec. Uh, <coughs> if you're if you're able to, I know you I know you're running on uh, a hardcore version of Linux, probably. Yeah, yeah. Um, it should work. Uh, one sec, because it's a because I'm using VS Code and that's an Electron app. But uh, yeah, one sec here. I'm ready. You are ready? No. Okay, I got okay. a big error message from Zoom saying that Zoom recording. So while we while we wait for uh, Isaac to come back, um, the different tasks um, for data analysis. This is where the machine learning workers principally live. The clustering worker clusters repositories based on the patterns of communication that are identified as present. It also does topic modeling for each of the repositories so we can see what kind of topics are discussed. Discourse analysis identifies 11 different categories of discourse, which can then be used to uh, discern a time sequence analysis of how conversations go uh, around pull requests and issues on individual repositories. And the message insights worker uses a software engineering tuned <clears throat> sentiment analysis and novelty detection algorithm uh, to identify uh, the nature of speech in terms of uh, inclusive or not inclusive. There are also a couple of repositories that we're adding uh, to this worker to look at um, inclusiveness specifically and also ableist language. And the pull request analysis worker looks at the history of pull requests around projects and makes a probabilistic estimate about how likely a particular pull request that is currently open um, is likely to be merged. The Git worker is, this is entirely facade. So it has, uh, it runs the old facade tasks as we've modified it. There's some user utilities that we have um, in here. Um, so that's all that the Git worker does is everything related to commits. The GitHub worker, as, as I noted uh, previously, it looks at contributors. So all the logic for resolving the email addresses and the con uh, to a contributor on a platform takes place here. Uh, the move detection um, worker is the first one that runs and it, it determines if a repository that's currently in our set for collection has moved. So it's more frequent than you might think than that a repository will change organizations or change its name. And when that happens for a period of it's my anecdotal observation up to about a year and a half, GitHub will continue to resolve all of the old links uh, to this new location, but we just go about proactively moving it. Events look at the event stream on GitHub GitHub does have a 400 uh, page limit of 100 uh, instances, so <clears throat> you always get the last 40,000 events, but the longer you're collecting, the less likely you are to have gaps. Uh, Facade GitHub is really focused on that contributor right resolution piece, so it, it's in the GitHub directory because it uses the GitHub APIs to resolve contributors. 
issues and pull requests are fairly straightforward. They gather all of the issue and pull request related data. Uh, as I mentioned, all the messages are in the same table. So once it, all the issue, all the issues and all the pull requests are created, we'll start collecting messages for or each of them. And in all, in generally speaking, we literally get every single message uh, and its metadata that's issued against a pull request or an issue on a platform. Releases specifically looks at um, if you if you were to go to GitHub, uh, for example, it gets this metadata. So you can see there's a releases thing down in the lower right. Anytime there's a release, um, you get this, uh, you get all of the data about a release and all of the releases on a repository collected. Release data can be especially useful for when you're trying to look at activity in a time period that reflects the interests and needs of a of a repository. So if I look at my, for example, my cycle of pull requests, issues, and commits, and I just look at them by month, those months have less meaning in terms of the cycles of a project than if you were to look at them in the context of time between releases. <clears throat> time between releases tends to be a, a good indicator of the cycles. Um, now that said, not all GitHub repositories, I, I would say slightly more than half, but less than two, less than three quarters, somewhere between half and three quarters do use releases, um, but a quarter to a half don't. <clears throat> so obviously that data is only useful when you're doing, you know, when you're, when they actually are issuing releases. Repo info is especially important and uh, as a, uh, for Augur because what repo info shows you is all of the data about a repository that is platform metadata. So if I go to I think this is no all right. Activity metadata repo underscore info, of course. I don't follow my own. So <clears throat> this is important because if I look at the number of forks, the number of watchers, the number of committers, all very interesting. Where it gets super interesting, let me go down where there's some actually some data. Issues count. Because we're collecting all the issues and we get the issues count metadata, we can know if we have them all. Same with pull requests. If I get the pull request count, I should have 1,459 pull requests for this repository and 462 issues for this repository. That's, that's important because now I, now I can tell with some, with a great deal of confidence that when you're doing analysis of pull requests, issues, and commits, that you do in fact have all of the data. Um, most other tools do not do this verification or give you visibility into this verification. And so, for example, with ghtorrent or git archive, there's no metadata and we know there is data missing. Um, with, with other tools, there is no validation that we have the correct count. And so one of the things that I think Augur does well that's super important is validate against um, the platform metadata to ensure that we have everything. Any questions or should I keep talking? Oh, Isaac, you're back. I should be able to share uh, my screen now. Okay. All right. Sorry. I just, I just kept rattling on. Go, go ahead. Yeah, no problem. Uh, okay. It looks like it's working. Okay. You're sharing your screen now. I believe I need to, sh are, are you sharing your screen in zoom? Yes. Okay. So everyone can see this. Yeah. Okay. Awesome. So, I think what we want to know is, well, one of the things we want to know is 
like let's take the the value worker for example when i guess you could explain it first but what i'm thinking of are what i'm thinking of is what are the steps if one wanted to convert the value worker um into a task well uh um i actually did this with the release worker um which I, i've converted into a, the release task right here or collect releases okay um and i got i went to the old uh like logic and i put it in um well first of all i put the whole thing in the uh in the github um get in the github file under tasks and okay made a, and then i made a folder for what task it is so it's the releases uh stuff that, that goes in its own folder so your first uh, and then uh so converting uh so steps in i'm just going to do steps in the notes steps to convert old workers in main to tasks in auger new so yeah. one is you copied the just, uh, their old worker into a task file under tasks uh, i wouldn't copy the entire file what i would do is i would just like get the directory structure organized before i would start writing like um i would so just like can you create a folder can i what um so you create a i guess uh can you, can you just walk us through it so like what does that mean create a work create so i'm imagining i've got a workers directory with value worker in it would you just first create a value worker a value directory in one of the tasks yeah pretty much i mean it depends like i don't uh what's the value worker do the value worker does all the code complexity counting and does that interface with the github api it does not yeah then that should probably go and like um uh, either Git or its own folder if it's not related to like the Git log or GitHub, because like it's mainly organized by like data source. Um, so if it's like a machine learning worker, or it, something, it, put it does in. reference the facade cloned repo directory. So I su suspect it goes in the Git worker. Yeah. So for that one, I'll put Git it in task the Git folder. Director. Git task yeah, I'll put directory. It in Git. Um, and then in the Git folder, I create the value worker folder. And then in that folder, what you want is you want a task.py and you want a core.py. Um, and task.py and core.py. And is there yeah. any like template or what would be, what would the template for those be? Maybe you could walk us through what that um, would look like. It would look a lot like the releases. Well, this, the rele I chose the um, releases model just because it's really simple. Uh -huh. um, because first you would just like import all the database and like stuff that you need to run it. So you need to set the database session um, that we have. It need the um, well first you need to you need to import the other file because that's a part of it. But uh, and then you basically just need to import the database stuff and the other stuff that you're writing over here. I don't know if you can see my cursor, but um, so is this the um, so core. I see. So the tasks.py imports core.py, but what goes in core.py? Core.py <laughs> is, is the actual functionality of the worker. The task should just be like the logic that starts it. You know? Okay. So like it, um, you can have like easy error handling for like the whole model, like from here. Um, and then all of like the actual like manipulation of data and insertion to the database and everything happens here. Okay. So when um, so when you did this, I assume you had to change. Bye, Ruth. I see. I assume that you had to change lots of things or some things about what was in the value worker. Um, I didn't have to change as much as I thought. Um, I pretty much uh just had to um uh like manipulate it so that it would uh, interface nicely with our database uh orm um and insert correctly but uh um it wasn't that hard to do like here yeah like so, the, the, this is how we insert data now which is a lot simpler than the old way that we did it in my opinion at least um just like 
any of the the list of dictionaries of data that you need to insert, the table that you're inserting it into, and the unique key on that table for um, support for uh, on conflict do update. And uh, if it, if uh, you're not doing an on conflict do update insert, then uh, um, it is most likely better to do it in an actual like uh, SQL text and then just executing that SQL text. Um, but in most places, you you would you want to do the on conflict do update. Hmm. So um, session insert data blah blah. What does it say on conflict do update? Um, that's the here. Well, the insert data method is for the on conflict do update. There is an option to not um, to change it to an on conflict do nothing. Like that's what the insert data um, method is for. Um, mm -hmm. If you want to insert it manually, you still can with a um, you can do like a uh, like an s dot sql dot text option, and you can just uh, write sql here. Like yeah. and then you can just execute that. Um, but yeah, mo but in most cases, you want to do the on conflict do update or the on conflict do nothing, which is why it's just called insert data as a general method. <clears throat> but there are cases in which you would need to do um, like a specific SQL query, and you can still do that. OK. So prob probably, um, Ahmed, what time, what, in what time frame is your group thinking of um, doing your auger sprint? I don't know if we lost Ahmed or... Yeah, hey, sorry, I, I was... Um, so um, I think um, sometime over the weekend, so maybe we could just... Um, galvanize those who will be interested to register for the event and then um, let them have like an idea of what the um, project is about so that they can prepare towards it and then we have like um, a five, four to five hour sprints where we can get them involved and contribute in different capacities. Okay. Um, what I'm what I'm thinking is um, so you kind of uh, I'm so the way that I think it could be done is if we um, the way that I think this might work is if uh, we would do two things to support that effort. Um, one is depending on the time of day. Possibly, I could be available for basic questions. Obviously, there's a getting Augur installed part that needs to um, take place. What operating system are most of the folks working in? Ahmed. Um, most of them we're working with um, Windows, Windows operating system. For me, I'm working with mm -hmm. a, uh, a Linux machine, and we also have very few people to work in with um, Mac, Mac laptops. But majority will be Windows. Are they comfortable at a Unix command line? Um, yeah, I think some of the um, intermediate users will be more comfortable with um, um, it's the Linux um, command line, yeah. They would be comfortable with the Unix command line? Yes, yes, yes. Okay, and how many participants do you think that you might have? Um, we can have around um, 20. Okay. That's, yeah. Okay, so with 20 participants, um, for new for new data collection, Isaac, I'm just trying to. So one thing I can think of is if uh, we created a branch that sort of templated out the basic steps and created an issue explaining what needed to be done for 
three workers. Oh yeah, uh, I, I, I that's definitely something that we should have. Um, and, and then, so if we did that, then so essentially we could create a branch where the the workers weren't working yet, but we had some, you know, we described in the issues what needed to be done for each of the three that I have in mind. Um, and then with twenty people, um, I think if we had a general template, they they could. Uh, so everything that we get right now is from from GitHub. I don't know if if there are other pieces of information you would want to get from GitHub, or if some of them might want to work on API endpoints or things like that. Um, or, or yeah, that would also be something interesting as well. Okay. Yeah, uh, uh, Andrew would definitely appreciate that if people wanted to help with endpoints. Okay, perfect. Um, so, Ahmed, I think um, if you're doing it this weekend, I think uh, maybe if you could give us a few days here to put together those templates and uh, issues, uh, or how much how much in advance do folks need? Um, yeah, we can do this weekend, or to get more people, we can have it um, next weekend. Uh, but I also have a question. Is, is there a way we could um, help people who, for some reason, are maybe not able to finish their um, tasks that day and maybe they need some extra support to complete their tasks after that, um, that event? Yeah, I think uh, one, one way, of course, is always uh, issues. Uh, another, another good way is uh, I will schedule another one of these sessions. Like if you did it in... If, if, if it's if you're flexible and you did it like not this coming weekend, but the weekend after that would give us more time to be prepared. Um, oh, yeah, that, that works. You can do it next weekend. Then. So that would be, I don't know, it'd be like the weekend of uh, my knowledge of calendars is uh, limited. Hang on, let me find. Uh, let me find my calendar. Okay, so yeah, this. What are you thinking? Like the Saturday or Sunday or what day of the week are you thinking? Um, Saturday. Saturday would be perfect. Okay. Okay. So wait a minute. Isaac, Thanksgiving's on the twenty fourth, right? uh that sounds right okay yeah so all right we yeah that that would work i can i can i can be around um to, to do some uh, support on that day but i think probably the last uh thing that we need to think about is auger has historically been difficult for people with windows computers to install it on and um because Windows, everything on Windows, I mean, you're in a Python community, you understand, Ahmed, that everything works differently on Windows. Yeah. <laughs> and, and I don't know how experienced your community is with dealing with all of those in, 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 uh, idiosyncrasies. Okay, so what we can do is we can just um, streamline um, this first um, cohorts to people who actually have... Um, um, a Unix machine, either Mac or um, Linux, so that you know um, that's that kind of sets a bar, so that we we don't have we don't waste too much time trying to help yeah. people. I think uh, I, I think I think Docker would be a solution. Isaac's kind of our expert on Docker. I I'm I suspect Docker deploys on Windows. I don't know how easy it is to do development when you're constructing things in a Docker container, Isaac. I don't know if you've ventured it in there be yeah. too much harder um the docker container is functional although uh i don't know if it's like production ready um it doesn't have like, to be production ready for this <laughs> <laughs> that's fair uh it's definitely like ready to, to like tinker with at least 
Um, okay. Like last time I ran it, it ran. Uh, although I have not run, run it in a while since I've been trying to do a bunch of the Todd stuff. Yeah. Uh, so so maybe the thing that we can get ready for you this week, Ahmed, is um, the uh, 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 Docker for Windows. Okay. And um, my, oh, the t the task the task examples um, and stubs and maybe something similar for API endpoints. And perhaps you and I could have a conversation um, maybe on this day next week where we, we go through some of that in a bit more detail. Okay, okay, that, that, that's, that's gonna be great. Okay, um, so I will, um, I will just put a, I'll just put the same session on the calendar on the chaos calendar for next week. Um, and we, we can catch up then. Um, if that if that works for you. Yeah, I, I think um, this time next week also works for me. Um, that right. is, um, is it? So it's, um, <laughs> it's um, for 450 here right now. So I don't know what time. So it's it's 1050 here. So it'll be five o'clock there shortly. So this started at three o'clock your time. Yeah, um, so it's it three o'clock. Yeah, then I think that that will work fine. Yeah, I'll just um, I'll go ahead and just uh, make this particular um, meeting uh, occur again next week at the exact same time. Okay. Uh, and I I have a dentist appointment at eleven twenty, so I think we're gonna fall short of getting through our entire agenda, most significantly the auger install. But I will um, I'll make a separate recording of that later okay. today, All so right. that so that I can refer you to that. And this recording. Um, are you in the chaos Slack? Yes, yes, I am. So I will make a note in the chaos Slack about where this recording ends up. Um, I think Ruth has already um, created like uh, an introductory um, conversation between three of us, so we can just continue from there. Yeah, I mean, I'll, I'll probably uh, I'll, I'll probably just share it in the general channel though, so that others have access to it. The the Augur channel. So there's an oh. auger channel on the chaos slack and I'll, I can share it in that initial conversation as well. I just wanted you to know, I would also be sharing it in the, um, in the, in the auger, in the auger slack, um, on the chaos channel so that others are aware of what we talked about here. All right, sure. All right. Sounds good. Yeah, yeah, that's great. That's great. Thank you All very right. much. Well, thank, thank, thank you, Ahmed. Uh, nice to see you again. Meet. Hopefully, you got some stuff out of this. I think Ruth, yeah. Ruth certainly learned a bit, and um, we'll talk with you all again soon. All right. Bye bye. Um, also, Sean, can you just uh, add that uh, Slack bot uh, over the meeting as well, so that we can get a reminder on Slack for the meeting in the next week? Does the uh, because does, for today. Is there something special I have? Do I have to invite the Slack bot? Is that the deal? Uh, I guess Ruth was just mentioning that to me that uh, there is something specially to be done. Uh, okay. To... I'll, I'll, I'll ask Elizabeth, um, what do I have to do with the Slack bot? Um, so I can find it. All right, I'll, I'll check. I'll, I'll take care of that. Yes. Okay. Right. And uh, right away from this portion, like of developing the worker and all, we'll go through it uh, the next week only, right? Yeah. I mean, I'll record uh, installing Augur. Um, 
recording okay. later today. All right, all right. I'll do. All right, talk to them later. Thanks a lot.